but I want to focus entirely on the slowing thing. So to do that, let's look at this animation. So suppose you have a piece of glass with an index of refraction equal to 1.5. That means that light will travel at two thirds the speed of light in the glass. If you shoot a laser at the glass, the light from the laser will travel at the speed of light until it hits the surface of the glass. When it hits the surface of the glass, the light will slow down to two thirds its original speed and it will change its direction. Once the light gets to the other side of the glass, it will emerge from the glass, change its direction and move again at the speed of light. That's what happens. In addition, the light emerging from the glass will travel in exactly the same direction. Well, more precisely, in a path that is parallel to the direction of the incident light. The path is offset a smidge to the left, but the angles are the same. So that's what happens. It's been tested and there's no debate on any of that. So now for the real question, why does light slow down? And how can it speed up again when it leaves? However, the reason that light slows down in material is better illustrated if one embraces the idea of it being a wave. There are many properties of a wave and most importantly, the wavelength. The wave oscillates up and down with a separation between peaks and a time between oscillations. A second important property is what we call superposition, which is just a fancy way to say that you can add them. And adding them is easy. You just take the height of the two waves and add them together. If the two waves are lined up so the peaks are at the same place, the result is a single wave with a higher peak. If the wave is lined up so a peak corresponds to a trough, then the two waves cancel. And if one wave has a different wavelength than the other, you end up with a funny looking shape. That's just how it works. It gets more interesting when one wave is moving at a different speed than the other one. The result is a different wave, but one that has a different speed than either of the two. That's super important, so let's just take a careful look at it. If we add the two top waves, which have different speeds, the bottom wave also moves, but slower. So let's get back to light moving through glass or water. Remember that light is a wave of electric fields. It oscillates with a characteristic wavelength and frequency. That wavelength depends on the color of light with blue light being about 400 nanometers and red light being about 700. The numbers don't matter as much as that you remember that light is changing electric fields. Now, of course, glass is made of atoms, which are surrounded by electrons. Electrons have an electrical charge and that charge feels a force from the oscillating field of light. Because it feels a force, the electrons move but moving electric charges also set up their own oscillating electric field. Said simply, the oscillating electric field of light makes electrons move, which makes a second oscillating electric field. And if you have two oscillating electric fields, that's two oscillating waves, and you can add them together just like we saw before. The net effect is that the two waves combine and make a single wave of oscillating electric fields. And that is the wave that moves through matter. And, and this is important, it moves at a slower speed than light does in a vacuum. This also explains something that many people were confused by. Most people were willing to accept that passing through glass would slow down light, but they were very puzzled about light speeding up when it left the glass. That seemed like it created energy and well, that didn't make any sense. But now I hope it does. Before light hits the glass, it travels at the speed of light in the vacuum. When it passes through the glass, the light causes the electrons to move and generate a second wave that adds to the light. Light still moves at the speed of light in the vacuum, but the wave from the electrons move at a different speed and the combined wave moves slower than light would if the atoms weren't there. Then, when light leaves the glass, there are no atoms around to make electric fields to add the light, and then light speeds along at the preferred vacuum speed. So that's it. Light effectively travels slower through material because when it is in material, it generates a second wave that combines with the light, and the combined new wave moves slower than the familiar speed of light. Because I want to get into the question of what is the physical process that causes the path of light to change as it enters the glass. 
It turns out that the only way to really answer the question of why light bends when it goes from air to glass is to get serious about the nature of light and to embrace the fact that it is made of oscillating electromagnetic fields. And that means you need Maxwell's equations. Because this isn't a full-blown physics class, I'm going to focus only on the electric fields. And I'm not going to do the derivation because that's the fun part. I'll leave that to you. But the big ideas are actually pretty straightforward. You start with Maxwell's equations, which are always beautiful to see. They're a little scary looking, but the question we're trying to answer is an easy one, which makes the whole thing a lot simpler than you'd imagine. In fact, we're going to need only the bottom two equations. So let's see what's going on. We start with light going from air to glass, hitting the surface at an angle. In our figure, we can replace the waves with the direction of motion. Now it turns out that the electric field of light is perpendicular to the direction that light is traveling, and we can add that field direction to the diagram. And it's very important to remember that this field has a component both parallel to the surface of the glass and one that is perpendicular to the glass. And here is where Maxwell's equations come into play. Two copies of the equations are written here, one that covers when light is traveling in air and one where it is traveling in glass. So here's the key point. The surface belongs to both the air region and the glass region. This means that at the surface, the equations on the top and the equations on the bottom have to apply. And with that little bit of calculus, you can find two important restrictions. The first is that the electric field parallel to the surface of the glass has to be the same in the air and the glass. And similarly, perpendicular to the surface, what has to be the same is the electric field times this epsilon, which is different for each material and depends on its molecular makeup. We can then manipulate these equations to see what the electric field in glass should look like. Because epsilon is bigger in glass than in air, that means that the perpendicular electric field in glass has to be smaller than it is in air. Now we remember that the direction the light travels is perpendicular to the electric field, so we can put in an arrow to show the direction light must travel in the glass. And finally, we can see what light does when it enters glass or water or any transparent medium. It bends. And the reason that it bends is because the epsilon in glass is bigger than in air. Okay, what I just showed you is an equation thing. You're probably asking yourself what that epsilon actually physically means. It's there because of how the electric fields from the light interacts with the matter in the glass. You start out with glass with no electric field in it. The glass has charges in it, but they're arranged in a random way. But when you send light in, you impose an electric field on it. That field makes the charges move around, which sets up a counterbalancing electric field from the charges. The result is that the electric field in the glass is lower than it is in air because of how the electric field from the glass is in the opposite direction. And this is the reason that the perpendicular electric field is lower in glass. And that, my friends, is why light bends when it goes from air to glass. It's not because of many of the ordinary explanations. It's because of how light interacts with glass and changes the glass's properties. And it's because the electric field inside the glass is affected by the arrangements of atoms and molecules in the glass when light hits it. It's the same reason why light slows down in matter. Inside matter, the electric field due to the light and the electric field due to the matter, both have to be taken into account. Outside, they don't. Suppose you had a vacuum with a light beam in it with an electrically charged particle like an electron or a proton traveling alongside it at very nearly the speed of light, say 99.99% .99 that speed or something. The two of them would stay together pretty much, although the photon would slowly pull ahead. Now, suppose that we shoot the two of them into a huge tank of water. If we did that, the electron would continue to travel at 99.99% the speed of light in the vacuum, while the light beam would instantly slow down to 75% its normal speed. In this situation, the electron would be traveling faster than light. 
When Cherenkov saw the blue light emanating from water surrounding a radioactive sample, he told his advisor, Sergei Vavilov. Vavilov shared the observation with two of his colleagues, Igor Tam and Ilya Frank, and Tom and Frank figured out what was going on. It turns out that when an electrically charged particle moves through a dielectric medium at a speed faster than light moves through that material, light is emitted, and that light is called Cherenkov's light. Now, the exact detailed mechanism whereby light is emitted is quite complicated. Maybe I'll describe it in a future video. But basically, it's created because the electric field of the charged particle disrupts the electrons of distant atoms, and those disruptions cause even more disruptions to other atoms. When you add up everything, Cherenkov light is emitted, but only if the charged particle is traveling faster than light. If light is emitted at a point represented by this X here, it radiates from that point in a sphere. You can see how it works in this animation. The sphere grows at the speed of light. But the particle, which is represented by this red dot, is traveling faster than the speed of light. You can see that the dot moves away from the X faster than the sphere grows. Now suppose light is emitted when the particle is set at a different location. That light will also leave the point in a sphere, and the sphere will also grow. This process can appear again and again and again with a series of spheres. The edges of the spheres line up, which you can see here. And, of course, light isn't emitted just at these locations where the X's are marked. The light is emitted everywhere along the path of the charged particle, and the result is a cone of light growing around the path taken by the charged particle and traveling forward. So those are the basics. A charged particle traveling faster than light in an appropriate material results in the particle and material combining to give off light. That light tends to be from the purple and blue side of the spectrum. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But scientists can use more information than the simple observation of blue light. The shape of the cone tells you how fast the particle is going. If it's going near the speed of light, then the cone is very fat. But if the particle is going much faster than light in the medium, then the cone is very skinny. Another thing scientists can exploit is the fact that some particles are created in the transparent medium moving just faster than light, and then, because of interactions with the medium, they slow down below the speed of light. That means the particle will emit Cherenkov light for a little while and then stop doing so. And that means that the light will not be a cone forever. Instead, you'll see a gap between the two wave fronts. Now, what I've shown you here is in two dimensions, but, of course, it's a three-dimensional thing. The light comes out as a ring. This particular feature is very useful in huge Cherenkov detectors. For instance, the Super Kamiokande experiment in Japan is a ginormous tank holding 50,000 tons of water. It's a cylinder about 40 meters, both in diameter and height. That's about 130 feet for Americans. In the Super Kamiokande detector, or Super K, as it's often called, neutrinos enter and interact with the water. The neutrinos convert into electrons or muons, which are charged particles that can emit Cherenkov light. That's basically how it works. Some of the neutrinos that interact in the water are low enough energy that electrons or muons don't travel very far. Therefore, the Cherenkov light makes rings inside the detector. Using the size of the rings and the time the light arrives at detectors throughout the apparatus, scientists can figure out the energy and trajectory of the parent neutrino. Really a very cool technique. Cherenkov light is used for many purposes in particle physics experiments, but it's probably mostly used in these big water neutrino detectors. 